Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Journal Club. Um, we have the uh, uh, fortunate opportunity to host Journal Club today, and our topic is proximal junctional kyphosis. And um, we have some very interesting articles, and um, we also have uh, some uh, great um, literature to review. And we're going to kind of talk about everything prevention, um, definition, classification. And um, uh, our first speaker is Zach Tataren. Before I start, I just want to quickly um, uh, uh, recognize and give a moment of silence to Dr. Preston Phillips. Um, I actually met Preston through. Uh, SSF, he came up to me at a course. He used to be a practicing orthopedic surgeon at Swedish. And Jens, I think you knew him better than I did. I, I met him once. Sadly, um, he was uh, uh, murdered uh, by one of his patients. Um, I think you saw it on, in the Wall Street Journal. And, um, you know, he'd come up to me and he, we were at a course and he said, hey, um, I'm Preston Phillips. I've seen you on SSF TV. And uh, he'd watched all our videos, great guy. Um, I personally didn't know him that well, but I think Jens and some of the other orthopedic surgeons knew him. It's, it's kind of a tragedy, but I just wanted to recognize Preston and, and, uh, and also SSF. I mean, it shows you the power of education um, and technology, so. Um, hey, Rod, Rod, yeah. can I just quickly add on that? So I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person for a Global Spine Congress with several of us here. And, and Vegas. Uh, Dr. Preston Phillips uh, was a eminent and outstanding member of our community here in Seattle. He left in 2006 um, to go back to Oklahoma, where he was from. Uh, not only was he a very caring spine surgeon, uh, he was a, a truly compassionate human being. And the senselessness of these murders as uh, personified in him. This is a man who felt very fortunate uh, to be able to give back to the community and uh, felt very for that he had such a, a great background with education at Harvard and a premier education including spine surgery. And uh, he annually gave back uh, by going uh, to Togo in West Africa and doing volunteer work there on the university, of course, and initially organized on his own cost by himself. So uh, I was just struck as a fellow orthopedic spine surgeon who was at the time at the University of Washington with how incredibly compassionate and caring this man was. And again, the murder of him, just like children and other innocent civilians, is just uh, really shocking and saddening. And so I call it also a question of the very poor mental health uh, of our country. Um, I'm going to stay out of other things, but I want to personify this on Dr. Preston Phillips, uh, who at the premature age of 59, and any age is premature for that matter, was murdered in cold blood uh, by somebody who clearly was deranged uh, in the thought processes and uh, struck uh, uh, people who were uh, very eminently involved in the process of caring uh, for their fellow human beings. So thank you for allowing me to intercede for that. I appreciate that you made that uh, mention of Preston and uh, we will miss him and we will very, uh, uh, very closely hold this uh, uh, memory high and uh, obviously uh, send our thoughts uh, to his family. So thank you and uh, for hosting this live Rod. Thanks, Jens. Um, so Dr. Zach Tataren is gonna talk about um, PJK. Um, he's gonna, also gonna talk about definition, classification and risk factors and prevention. Good morning, everyone. I'm Zach, neurosurgery spine fellow here at Swedish. This is a overview, lit review of proximal junctional kyphosis, proximal junctional failure. I'll try and stay on time. Um, this is just a brief or just a general overview of those. Um, and the subtopics are covered in more detail um, in the further papers later today. So. Um, there's no universally accepted definition for proximal junctional kyphosis, um, but the most common one and the one that's utilized most frequently is a proximal junctional angle greater than 10 degrees that is at least 10 degrees greater than the preoperative measurement. Um, risk factors can be classified patient-related, radiological, and surgical, and prevention strategies are critical. 
So introduction, um, so develop, uh, PJK, development of kyphosis at the transition between fused and mobile segments in the adult spinal deformity area. Um, it's considered a radiological phenomenon, um, whereas proximal junctional failure is a progression of PJK, um, and it's actually the clinical manifestation of this. Um, and as I said before, uh, the common definition is uh, sagittal cob angle greater than 10 degrees that is at least 10 degrees greater than the preoperative measurement. Um, so as I said, PJF is a progression of PJK. It's associated with structural failure, adjacent vertebral body fractures, posterior ligamentous complex development, and vertebral subluxation. Um, it's associated with a lot of clinical factors like pain, gait disturbances, neurological deficits, often warrants revision surgery. Um, so, as I said, there's been at least eight proposed definitions for PJK and PJF, but the one that I stated before um, is the one that most people go with. So, um, proximal junctional failure uh, is PJF that requires surgical treatment, um, and it can be attributed to one of four main causes, uh, fracture, spondylolisthesis, uh, implant slash hardware failure, and PJA progression. Um, compared with PJK, PJF is uh, clinically a lot more significant uh, with more pronounced ODI score differences. Um, in terms of classification, there have been a few classification systems proposed, the one that's most uniformly used and I think will be covered uh, in more depth in one of the later talks uh, is one by our own Dr. Hart, who proposed the PJK severity scale, which has, uh, this is the scale on the right, it has six components, neuro deficits, focal pain, instrumentation problems, UIV or UIV plus one fracture, and the level of UIV. And you can see those points associated uh, with each category. And if the total severity score is seven or greater, uh, revision surgery should be conserved, uh, considered. And they're doing a study right now to uh, determine the validity of it. Um, in terms of risk factors, uh, proposed mechanisms include uh, expense, extensive paraspinal dissection at the upper instrumented vertebrae. Uh, so like accidentally exposing the next higher level would put you at a greater risk of this happening. Uh, posterior ligamentous complex destruction, uh, improper end vertebra selection at a transitional zone, severe proximal disc degeneration, uh, UIV compression fractures, or UIV plus one compression fractures, that's upper instrumented vertebra, uh, proximal instrument failure, and uh, similar to extensive dissection um, facet violation when it's otherwise unintended. Um, patient surgical risk factors, um, high BMI, low bone mineral density, that puts you at a twice as greater risk if you're osteoporotic or osteopenic, puts you at a twice greater risk of having um, proximal junctional kyphosis. Older age at time of surgery, if you're over 55, you have a three times greater likelihood. Um, they found that size of paraspinal musculature is associated with the ability to maintain uh, sagittal correction. So extensive muscular dissection or extensive muscular atrophy pre-op puts you at a greater risk of this happening. Um, putting into kind of uh, perspective the importance of PT and maintaining strong core stability musculature. Um, degree of post pre and post operative sagittal malalignment, so higher thoracic kyphosis, PJA, pelvic incidence, pre op SVA, overcorrection of SVA, uh, these all increase your risk of PJK. Um, surgical risk factors. They found that pedicle only constructs are associated with a slightly higher PJK rate compared to hook hybrid constructs. Um, PLC disruption, obviously. Uh, there's a three times greater risk of developing PJK if you do a front back front or front back um, as opposed to just posterior instrumentation only. Um, also, if you have selected the UIV in the thoracolumbar junction, so lower than T8, you have a higher risk of PJK. Um, and in this paper, they nicely outlined the risk factors uh, and clinical importances of PJK, which I'll touch on in a second. In terms of prevention strategies, things patients can do, uh, BMI optimization, 
using larger tricortical screws, uh, using less rigid rods, um, sublaminar hook wire supplementation, uh, percutaneous upper instrumented vertebrae instrumentation can minimize the amount of dissection at that level, cement augmentation at UIV or UIV plus one to minimize the risk of vertebral body fractures, transverse process hooks at the upper instrumented vertebra, um, terminal rod contouring, I thought that was interesting. They mentioned how if you perfectly contour the, the top edge of the rod to fit into the screws so you don't have to reduce the top screws, it's obviously going to minimize your risk of PJK. So proper rod contouring seems pretty important. Um, ligament augmentation with Marceline tape, there's a picture of that in the bottom right. Also a minimally invasive approach to minimize um, muscular dissection when possible. Uh, two more slides. So uh, this is just a picture of some of the the Marceline tape options, cement augmentation options, and obviously the goal is to attempt to achieve an optimal age adjusted sagittal alignment and correct PI lumbar low doses mismatch that minimizes your risk of PJK. So in conclusion, um, Proximal junction problems associated with higher morbidity, increased rates of revision. There's many definitions. The one that most people go with is proximal junctional angle greater than 10 degrees, at least 10 degrees greater than the pre-op measurement. And PJF is a progression of PJK requiring surgery. Um, my time is up. Great. That was terrific, Zach. Um, probably one of the better presentations I've seen on <laughs> The definition so terrific um, uh, talk and um, we're going to go to our next talk and in the meanwhile Jens um, I wanted to ask you um, do you really think doing Marceline tape and some of these other uh, do you think that really prevents um, a PJK or PJF no so do you think, I think, what do you think about hooks? What's, what's your strategies on preventing? So our next speaker um, is uh, Dr. Nathan Pratt. Uh, Nathan is gonna talk about um, uh, a nice review of some biomechanical studies um, about PJF and PJK. Thanks, Dr. Rao. Hey, Nathan Pratt here. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna look at a systematic review that assessed uh, uh, human and uh, non-human animal um, uh, studies on biomechanics of uh, various uh, top end uh, sort of soft transition zone uh, 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 instrumentation. So, uh, this is a systematic review uh, looking at instrumentation techniques to reduce proximal junctional kyphosis and long segment fusions. The inclusion criteria were any human and non-human animal cadaveric peer-reviewed journal articles assessing biomechanics with some sort of uh, objective measurement uh, of, of either interdiscal pressure or uh, rotational stability, something like that to evaluate whether these are providing some biomechanically measurable effect. Uh, so out of almost 3,300 articles that they searched, uh, only 12 actually met their um, uh, in, uh, inclusion criteria. You'll recognize this slide. Uh, Dr. Tataran just had this as well. This is just to make sure that we define the terms of what we're talking about. Uh, Mersaline tape, uh, so UIV, UIV plus one plus two being the vertebra above, they call the index level. The, uh, so if that was, T10, say, with the last screw in it, that would be 910. Uh, disc space would be the index disc space. Um, we talked about the tethers. Uh, they also talk about transverse process hooks in F, uh, something that we use a lot, laminar hooks in E, and then vertebroplasty, which is kind of a little more difficult to assess biomechanically, uh, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So let's go through a summary of the evidence that they present to us. Uh, suture loops and tethers, so combination of Marceline tape as well as uh, cables. Uh, Non-tension suture loops essentially had no effect on range of motion at the level of suture. Tensioned loops uh, did reduce range of motion and uh, intradiscal pressure at the index level. Uh, but multi-level tethers uh, had uh, uh, 
in effect at the index level, but not index plus one. So that UIV plus one UIV mattered, but the one above that UIV plus one plus two did not. Uh, cross links attached with uh, Mersaline or with uh, cables uh, did reduce range of motion as well, but this was only in the extension plane, not in flexion. And this was uh, the interdiscal pressures as well, and that was at that uh, index level. Sublaminar tapes, uh, single segment did reduce uh, intradiscal pressure and range of motion in both flexion and extension. Uh, tape at UIV plus one and two had no effect on that uh, index level plus one. The concern was that overtensioning actually increased extension, uh, possibly increasing posterior stress at UIV plus one, similar to reducing onto uh, a rod that would not be contoured properly. It's a similar concern that you're putting more stress at that top level and uh, UIV plus one. Laminar hooks showed variable results. There were uh, significant reductions in, one of the studies showed significant reduction in range of motion in all planes, which was relatively comparable. This was 93%. This is compared to native uh, uh, motion at these uh, motion segments. The authors of that conclude this stiffness is almost the same as pedicle screw fixation, so they question whether or not laminar hooks uh, are a soft transition zone or whether they're actually should still be considered rigid. Uh, another study by Metzger uh, showed a higher range of motion in all planes comparing laminar hooks and pedicle screws and the interdiscal pressures as well as the range of motion um, was decreased at the UIV plus one, which is where the hooks would have been at that UIV plus one uh, and at that index level, uh, but was not reduced to the same degree as it was uh, below that in the area of the pedicle screw construct. So they conclude that it is a uh, softer transition. Uh, transverse process hooks this is something that we use very frequently here. Uh, definitely a semi-rigid uh, uh, construct at the top of the pedicle screws. They had a similar cycle failure uh, to pedicle screws, so their breakage rates, uh, transverse process fracture rates were similar to the break rates they found when they were testing the pedicle screws. Uh, the problem was that they didn't compare this in the way that most people probably use transverse process hooks. They basically uh, took UIV and switched pedicle screws for TP hooks. So if they were doing a T10 to pelvis, they just put TP hooks at T10 instead of pedicle screws, which is not the way I think most people use transverse process hooks. Uh, they usually would then go UIV plus one with those. Uh, so it's a little more difficult to interpret the differences between uh, the pedicle screws and uh, the TP hooks. Either way, uh, the, they did present lower stiffness and flexion and extension at the UIV uh, compared to pedicle screws. Uh, but did uh, decrease the range of motion and the intradiscal pressures. Uh, they reduced stiffness uh, by over 50% compared with the all pedicle screw construct, which is considered, you know, theoretically is helpful in preventing uh, proximal junctional kyphosis. So they, again, conclude that this is a pretty reasonable option. Uh, just discussing the findings of the article, sutures and cables uh, could reduce range of motion and IEP if tensioned, uh, possibly reducing the stress transfer to the uh, pedicle, uh, pedicle screw bone interface at the top level. Uh, Sublaminar taping does reduce the flexion extension, uh, but only to 25% of non-instrumented fusion, uh, which uh, is similar to uh, sort of to pedicle screw fixations with possibly Sublaminar, oh, I'm sorry, that's sublaminar um, uh, 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 hooks, not taping, I apologize, uh, is, is possibly rigid, not uh, semi-rigid. Laminar hooks definitely reduced range of motion, had less of an effect on uh, intradiscal pressure, uh, but were not as rigid as pedicle screws, unlike the uh, sublaminar hooks, which sort of questionably were, were similar. Transverse process hooks appear to be a more gradual transition than pedicle screws. Uh, we didn't talk a whole lot about the bone cement because there aren't a lot of biomechanics to do there. It's not going to change your uh, flexion or extension uh, range of motion. It's not going to change, um, you know, the interdiscal pressure all that much. Uh, they basically looked at rates of fractures. They definitely decreased the rate of fractures at that top level and top level plus one. Uh, and there are definitely trans uh, translational and uh, retrospective studies already looking at that, uh, showing that. Uh, cement augmentation at UIV and or UIV plus one uh, can reduce uh, screw pullout and reduce the rate of uh, reoperation. 
Uh, suture loops, so clinical significance, the loops in the cables uh, do reduce biomechanical stress and potentially the rate of uh, PJK, uh, but additional, there is some translational research to suggest this transverse process hooks and laminar hooks. Both, they're considering to have some more of a semi-rigid fixation in biomechanical studies, the transverse process hooks, um, you know, ha have been looked at probably more in the uh, uh, translational research where they do show lower rates of PJK and proximal junctional failure. Vertebroplasty is a reduced fractures and screw pullout. So what do we take away from that? Biomechanical data is unfortunately better, very heterogeneous and relatively limited. This is only 12 studies uh, looking at this. Patient-specific factors and technical aspects of the surgery likely uh, are more related to PJK than even uh, some of the top-end instrumentation techniques. Biomechanically, all the techniques do show some ability to aid in a soft transition zone above the long spinal construct. And additional translational research is really going to be necessary to understand how uh, best to use these techniques. They're all, they all show some utility, um, all are relatively simple, um, but which one is superior, which one will actually reduce your rates of proximal junctional failure it's probably going to require even prospective study, which is going to be hard to do because of the heterogeneity of the indication for adult deformity surgery. It's not like, you know, sort of adolescent idiopathic scoli where there's a much more homogenous population. A lot of people have DGEN, a lot of people have missed uh, AIS um, that gets treated as an adult. So it, it, it's a little bit more, uh, the, the granularity of the data is not quite as good usually. But anyway, uh, that's beyond the scope of this paper, but that, hopefully that's helpful. So what are your, um, so you're gonna go out and practice mm -hmm. in the next couple months. Um, what's your takeaway from your experience here at Swedish and then also, what's your takeaway from the literature review? Are, are you gonna do a hook, sublaminar, hooks, um, construct, uh, Merceline tape? Combination of those things. So okay. I think that uh, I really like transverse process hooks. I think that they're relatively easy to place. It's pretty quick. Um, there's not a lot of, uh, there's a little bit of fiddling to try to contour the rod properly at the top because you can't reduce onto those hooks, obviously. Uh, so that adds a little bit of time, but not a lot. You disrupt a little bit of that ligamentous tissue already just dissecting for pedicle screws. So having something to reinforce that I think is nice. Um, but we've done, uh, tethers around the uh, rods at the top, which I like as well. Puts a little more stress holding them down rather than allowing them back out. I think a combination of all the techniques based on the patient I'm treating. Um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, Dr. Hart likes the uh, um, tape around the, or the wire cables around the um, uh, 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 cross-link tensioning to put a little bit more force pulling back. Uh, I think all of those techniques uh, in the biomechanical literature have some value. Um, the one I've probably done the most is the TP hooks here, yeah. and I think that that one's probably the easiest of those. Honestly, yeah. it doesn't take a whole lot of work to just recontour the rod a little bit. Great, great job. Jens, you cut out. I think you were uh, uh, having some technical issues. Um, uh, do you put TP hooks on, on every single uh, T10 pelvis or Deformity case. What's your no, take? but any any patient. So first of all, um, all the uh, discussions were very good. I think they're very complete. Um, the one aspect that was not discussed is how high do we go? Do we go to the upper thoracic spine or the lower thoracic spine? Clearly, and this is where our partner Dr. Hart has had a great impact on literature. The rate of junctional failures is lower if we go to the upper thoracic spine, but obviously it comes at a cost of more surgery to the patient perhaps longer recovery, perhaps even more occupational adaptations due to a reduced thoracic mobility, and um, uh, obviously greater risk probably in general due to the extra one or two hours of surgery time. So this is uh, an aspect we have not discussed or directly discussed. Uh, I personally uh, do like transverse process hooks, and if, if I'm very worried, I'll add sublaminar cables to stabilize those a bit. Uh, and I may use uh, rostral cement and adjacent segments um, with great, greatest possible care if I'm worried about bone. The key thing is, again, that as Zach had pointed out earlier, this is a multifactorial process. There are, there's bone, there's soft tissues. Uh, there's the way we dissect and preserve or disrupt the soft tissues. And then there's a patient's own physiology in terms of how able are they 
to stabilize themselves? Do they have neuromuscular problems? So these are multifactorial things. Let me ask one more question. We have Dr. Derman there. And uh, obviously, uh, usually ask the formative questions to Dr. Lieberman, but in your observations, and as a senior colleague who has run the QI committee, have you seen benefits or disadvantages of certain techniques? Is there a routine TBI strategy that you've seen? And is MIS truly involved with less roster junction failures? Thank you. I think this is the million dollar question. I wish that I had the answer to it. It seems like there's all these various, you know, techniques, but still we don't have an answer. You know, as a guy who personally, I don't do deformity. I do all minimally invasive stuff. Um, I can't say I have personal experience, but um, having seen at conferences, et cetera, all of these techniques being used, um, I can't say I've seen one that has uh, been the winner yet. Rod, for me, one of the biggest problems is, uh, first of all, uh, our decision-making. But one of the biggest problems is post-operative rehabilitation. Let's assume we've done everything right. Uh, what frustrates me greatly is when patients with long constructs are mobilized and they're pulled up by their arms. Uh, when they're walking, they're standing on walkers and bending forwards on their walkers, which are invariably too far in front. And uh, uh, they're not taught how to maintain a truly straight posture and how to mobilize properly. And uh, prone positioning or extensor exercises are literally not performed. So for me, this is one of those areas where we still need to kind of integrate multi-specialty efforts far better. I'll, sh I'll, I'll shut up. Thank you. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, yeah, and those are all great points. So our next speaker is Dr. Jerry Robinson. So Jerry's one of our outstanding orthopedic fellows. He um, is uh, going to talk about, um, he's going to do a systematic review on uh, PJK uh, after spinal uh, adult deformity surgery. So he's kind of looking at a specific topic. All right, thanks for having me. Um, are, are you viewing my slides well? Yeah. So looks okay, great. good. All right, so um, everybody's kind of hit on things already. This is another systematic review, and this is a uh, PJK and PJF after spinal deformity surgery. And so you can see these aims and objectives down here on the bottom left. Uh, with their literature review, uh, they search phrases like P proximal junctional, proximal junctional kyphosis, failure, uh, excluded any non-English uh, articles, and then used uh, got rid of case reports as well. And their final lit review ended up with 53 articles. <clears throat> and so I'll go through each one of these aims and objectives to try to see what the literature has provided us. Keep in mind, um, my uh, systematic review is from 2014, so it's a little bit earlier than previously presented. So some of the data is, um, or some of the talking points are similar to previous, but uh, incomplete in comparison. So um, incidents and definitions. So they, they found in the literature that uh, it ranged from five to 46% of patients actually um, were seen to have PJK. And, but most studies reported somewhere between 20 and 40%. And of those who did get PJK, 66% uh, occurred within three months, and 80% of those were in uh, 18 months. So uh, a little bit longer follow-up, and you'll probably get most of the patients that you see. Um, their, their definition, um, as Zach pointed out earlier, is defined uh, somewhat inconsistently in, or inconsistently in the literature, but most defined it as 10 to 15 degrees of kyphosis compared to the preoperative measurements. And their measurement ed, uh, method was using the sagittal Cobb method, using the inferior end plate of the UIV and the superior end plate of the UIV plus two. And you can see that on my picture on the uh, right there. <clears throat> and PJF, uh, represented something different, and that was mechanical failure or instability above the, the construct, not just the radiological kyphosis. And so what is the significance of it? Like, so what? Some people uh, reported it was just simply a radi radiologic finding, and others uh, actually correlated it with higher rates of pain. Um, but it likely represents a spectrum ranging from a benign radiologic finding to a more pathologic process that eventually leads to failure. And they did notice that um, some of the studies showed that when it was identified uh, postoperatively, uh, it can continue to progress up to two years afterwards. So really stressing the importance of long-term follow-up in these patients. And uh, they, they did try to correlate it with a ultimate angle um, of kyphosis that eventually led to failure. And uh, they tried to correlate maybe saying around 27 degrees um, may be the uh, 
the degree at which you see failure. And then uh, again, definition of failure was kyphosis and structural failure, either of the posterior ligamentous complex or the vertebral body fracturing. And those, those patients were um, correlated as having worse ODI scores, higher pain, and higher rates of neurologic deficit. And so what were the risk factors? We talked on a lot of them uh, recently, but older age, larger preoperative sagittal abnormal parameters, use of pedicle screws, not use of pedicle screws, use of hooks, thoracoplasty, getting rid of ribs, uh, under over correction. I mean, I've heard everybody, um, a lot of people suggest differing factors for how they try to prevent or um, get rid of PJK. And uh, believe it or not, straight to PJK, all of them, every single, everything I've ever heard ends up getting PJK. So I'm not sure we'd have the answer yet. Um, but <clears throat> uh, these, these were the ones that they tried to <clears throat> use as prevention strategies and they reviewed in the paper. So I thought the vertebral cement augmentation data was actually fairly well summarized. Um, they had low sample size studies uh, that showed PJK, but they had some biomechanical studies that were uh, not touched on previously. So I'll kind of go over those, but they basically loaded some uh, cadaver uh, bones and had a control and then um, stressed them. And they found that 83% fractured at that UIV or UIV plus one. And so what they did was they um, did varying uh, different constructs of using cement augmentation in these. And when you just cement uh, the UIV, they had a hundred percent fracture rate. When they did the UIV plus one and the UIV, they had a 16% fracture rate. So um, I'm familiar with using the UIV and UIV plus one doing cement augmentation in the top two there. Um, but other studies said that um, it's basically look at the preoperative uh, bone health preoperatively, whether that's using a CT densitometry using Hounsfield units or something like that, and going off of that to use your cement augmentation for. And then they touched on the cost effectiveness of using cement uh, versus having to do a revision surgery. <clears throat> the cons of using vertebral cement augmentation, though, were uh, in the kyphoplasty literature, up to 20% of those patients had adjacent level fractures. And I think a lot of us have seen uh, where you, you know, inject cement and then you just get fractures around the cement uh, at the uh, level above or level below. Uh, you can have increased disc degeneration around that cemented uh, vertebrae. And you can obviously get extravasation and decreased nutrient supply to that bone, which inhibits healing. They also tucked on, uh, touched on spinal hooks. Pedicle screws at the UIV are too rigid, so those, those studies showed higher rates of PJK or adjacent segment disease, which le ultimately leads to revision. And then hooks at the UIV was a softer landing zone, and those studies showed lower rates of adjacent segment disease or PJK. And other things they touched on was uh, vector uh, using um, the rib expansion or um, including a kyphotic level, so not stopping at a level that is kyphotic, but uh, ultimately, I think they, they said that having a balanced spine or getting your preoperative balance uh, was most important. And then lastly, no bias here, but I just wanted to touch on the best classification system. We got the, the heart classification. I have, I have no conflicts of interest in why this was the best one, but um, um, basically they were able to uh, say that a score of seven or more correlated with the need for revision surgery. And as uh, Zach alluded to earlier, they are doing um, some of the um, validity test in that now. So if there's any questions or comments, we can take those. So Jerry, I have a quick question for you. That was a great um, literature review. So you're going to go out and practice and um, you're going to be out practicing in the next several months. Um, are you going to, what's going to be your strategy to prevent um, PJK and ultimately PJF? Yeah. Um, fortunately, I train in here at Swedish. And so I think I've done all of these techniques, which is great uh, for me as a fellow. Um, and I think uh, seeing uh, complex spine pathology, I've seen probably every way of failure you can possibly see. And so um, I do think that I'm going to end up doing uh, UIV plus one tethering on a, um, on a cross link. Uh, I do like that and tensioning that at the top. I also think that the data for vertebral augmentation is pretty good, but I think ultimately uh, getting a balanced spine and a very well optimized bone health patient preoperatively is probably uh, my first and foremost. So delaying surgery until the patient has optimal bone health would be my preference. 
Uh, but again, that's obviously not always able to be done. So um, I do like those two. Rod, Jerry? Yeah. Yes. So one one thing, so a second, uh, this is again, although uh, there's an overlap, this is again a very good and uh, helpful summary and um, that offers some different perspectives. One question I had for Jerry uh, and for you, Rod, is um, what I've not heard is uh, intentional undercorrection. So with modern instrumentation techniques, we can actually reestablish a beautiful sagittal alignment. It's really amazing. But now there's some people who say we should uh, identify at risk patients and intentionally undercorrect the spine. Uh, so that's a major <laughs> concern for me because again, empirically speaking, my happiest patients are those where I've reestablished a nice lumbar lordosis and have a nice uh, thoracic smooth curve. And now there are people who say I should intentionally undercorrect them so I pitch their sagittal uh, axis forwards a little bit, especially elderly female patients. So that's uh, that's a concern to me. So I wanted to ask Jerry about that. And then I want to recognize that Dr. Fine had a good question again. That's if you put all hard versus soft landing uh, elements in direct comparison, what is to be favorite? So number one, intentional undercorrection, Jerry. And number two, address Dr. Huang's generalized question of hard versus soft rostral uh, junctions. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I actually think I've had the advantage of hearing both sides of that argument at SSF. Uh, we have a lot of speakers that like you said, some have advocated for undercorrection or age adjusted or physiologic adjusted. And I think there may be some merit to that, but I don't know that the answer uh, is there yet. In, in the age of big data, I think that that answer is coming eventually uh, for, one, uh, for one of the um, you know, key leaders in this area to eventually give us an answer to that. Um, I'm not sure that there is a, a solid answer, but I always think that um, a a better aligned spine is uh, ideal. Uh, delaying surgery uh, to have optimized bone health, I think those two factors are probably the ones that I consider to be um, the biggest factors for preventing that. So I think in my practice, starting out um, using age adjusted and optimizing the patient preoperatively are gonna be my, my strategies to uh, prevent PJK. So it sounds like you're going to try to do the soft landing. Uh, yeah, I do. I do think the soft landing is a, a better um, alternative using the uh, mercelline tape instead of a TP hook or a laminar hook. I think that biomechanical data that um, Nathan presented was actually fairly convincing that, you know, when you put a hook up there, it just makes it completely rigid, just like a pedicle screw. So I kind of like the uh, mercelline tape pretensioned with the uh, cross link. And I think location matters, don't you think, Jerry? I think uh, Dr. Chapman pointed out, I think, you know, I've had, personally, I've had way more failures at T10 um, than if you go up higher at like T4 or T2. What are your thoughts on location? Yeah, I think that might have some um, confounding in it. Um, if we stop at a kyphotic level, it may be, that might be the ultimate uh, answer rather than just the level. So I think it might be, um, patient specific, it, just looking at each patient individually and seeing if we're stopping at a kyphotic level may be more important than just the ultimate level. So getting past those layer, those uh, levels of kyphosis is probably most important. Great. Thanks, Jerry. I, I really appreciate um, your uh, um, uh, review. And uh, I know it's been a stressful week for you. Um, and uh, I know you're on uh, vacation right now, and um, you know it's so nice to see you. And we look forward to seeing you back on Monday. Are you coming back on Monday, or are you off still next week? I'm actually on vacation. Believe it or not, I'm on vacation. I don't, I don't love uh, traveling or being on vacation, but I, I won't miss these lectures. So I will, I will uh, thank, stay in thank touch. Thank you so much for um, uh, using your precious vacation time. We, we always uh, love it um, uh, when we can do this remotely. So our next speaker is um, Dr. Jared Cook. So Jared is gonna talk about um, global alignment scores and increased risk of complications. Um, and uh, uh, he's gonna review a, a nice paper about it. Yep. All of the scoring systems, uh, Jerry, you really should have uh, put Dr. Hart's five-day beard into his photo. All the cool kids are rocking it these days. Um, 
So my paper was, are high global alignment and proportion scores associated with increased risk of mechanical complications after adult spinal deformity surgery and external validation? Uh, so this so was done in 2020. Um, so essentially the, the question that they're asking is after adult spinal deformity surgery um, is a higher gap score associated with an increased risk of mechanical complications, um, proximal distal uh, junctional kyphosis or failure, um, is it associated with a high likelihood of undergoing revision surgery to treat mechanical complication? And is a lower, uh, AKA a more um, proportioned uh, gap score um, associated with better validated outcome scores? And they look at the uh, ODI SRS22 and SF36. <clears throat> and so, you know, this, uh, this supposedly had been, you know, validated previously, but so the, the, the question is why are, we, why are we asking this question seemingly again? And they identified that there were methodological um, limitations in the original GAP score uh, external validation study. Um, basically, the, uh, the original methodology um, for the study that they, uh, that they were working off of, um, they didn't quite follow that. Uh, the sample size was small. Um, the original inclusion uh, criteria uh, were not actually followed. And then there were just some vague definitions of, quote, mechanical complications. And so, um, you know, they went to, they went to the original study. They uh, looked at the 272 patients that were, um, that had corrective surgery for adult spinal deformity um, that were previously enrolled in the Scully Risk 1 uh, prospective trial. Um, so tried to use the same uh, the same data, and uh, they did their uh, their analysis fulfilling the uh, original inclusion criteria um, from the uh, Ilgore et al. Um, study, and so out of that, 59% of those patients were available for um, uh, for analysis after uh, two years. This mostly uh, female. Um, uh, 12 plus or minus four levels fused and 76% uh, had three column osteotomies. So their, their inclusion criteria, um, you know, followed the, uh, or inclusion and external, um, uh, or exclusion criteria followed the original. Um, so that was a age greater than or equal to 18 years, at least um, one of the following. It's uh, the scoliosis greater than, uh, or. Uh, 20 or greater degrees, SVA, uh, five or more um, centimeters, thoracic kyphosis greater than 60 degrees, pelvic tilt greater than 25, um, four or more vertebrae um, uh, uh, instrumented in the fusion, um, minimum of two years follow-up, and the ex uh, external, excuse me, exclusion criteria um, include neuromuscular disease, active infections, trauma tumor, um, no full-length x-rays available at baseline to compare it to, um, uh, uh, strictly early post-operative uh, period, that's uh, what they define as three to 12 weeks and uh, uh, planned uh, UIV within a previously fused segment. And um, so they uh, calculated the gap score, um, you know, using, uh, you know, previous parameters, using the pelvic incidence, sacral slope, lumbar lordosis, uh, both at uh, L1 to S1 and then the um, L4 to S1 uh, lordosis. Uh, and global tilt, the gap scores were, um, the proportional category was a score of zero to two, three to six is moderately proportional, and seven to 13 is dis severely disproportional. So basically your lower score was seen as, as better. Um, and here's what they found in the results. They had, there were mechanical complications, uh, you know, seen in all the categories, uh, proportion gap score is 13%, severely disproportion. Uh, was 31 percent, and uh, after their statistical analysis, it showed that a higher GAP score uh, was not associated with increased risk of mechanical complications uh, for revision surgeries. After um, after their uh, uh, statistical analysis, the higher GAP score did not associate with a higher likelihood of revision surgery to uh, treat mechanical complications. Um, the only things that they really got were that the moderately disproportionate GAP score was uh, associated with better uh, functional outcome scores compared with disproportionate uh, gap score. Uh, that was kind of it. Um, and they noted that they, they really did have some significant limitations here. So, uh, you know, as previously stated, only 59% um, of the patients in this study actually, um, you know, met inclusion criteria. Um, so we're pretty limited in the numbers. Um, the 
database patients had more complex deformities than the original GAP study. Uh, there was not an even distribution um, in GAP score. Um, the study uh, the study was not designed or powered to uh, validate the GAP score either. Um, so the uh, the conclusion is basically uh, setting alignment targets based on GAP score alone uh, does not actually contribute to uh, knowing your, your risk of uh, mechanical complications or revisions for that. And um, uh, the patient population is just, you know, too, uh, too heterogeneous. There were, um, you know, there were uh, uh, multiple comorbidities, uh, smokers, um, multifidus interrector, uh, muscle quality, um, uh, thoracolumbar muscle volume, all those things have been studied and, uh, you know, shown to, uh, you know, shown to have uh, some effect on the outcome, and these things were not taken into uh, you know into consideration. Um, so there's there's just more to look at than just you know strictly alignment. And so uh, you know this this study um, you know called into question the validity of the GAP score. Um, basically, it doesn't you know seem like it's a, a very useful tool to hang our hat on. So what's your what's your uh, um takeaway from your year here at Swedish, uh, the papers that we just reviewed, um, and your own personal experience, Jared, what's, what are you going to do? Are you going to do like a different technique for each case? Uh, no, um, I wouldn't say I would, uh, you know, do a different technique for each case. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's much better to have um, you know, something that works very well in uh, in your own hands, something that you can consistently, you know, perform well. Um, you know, that might be a couple of different things, but, you know, generally if you, uh, you know, try to do everything, you know, you might not really be good at any of them. Um, uh, you know, consistency is important. I, I think that when when looking at, you know, the this paper in particular, the, you know, the, um, you know, my takeaway from this, is that you know you can't um, you know you can't look at uh, you know kind of this one isolated uh, you know isolated factor and plan your entire you know surgery around it. There are too many things to take into account, and so um, I mean my answer really just mirrors what uh, what Jerry's was, um, and uh, I honestly have never even seen people use the gap score, so it's uh, that's not even on my going to be on my radar. So you're gonna you're gonna basically uh, take a little bit of everything and and try to optimize like rod contouring, um, you know. Have you, are you gonna put TP hooks or are you gonna do the um, soft landing? Um, I think uh, I think the soft landing um, is uh, is gonna be preferable. Um, so that's uh, that's actually probably the technique that I'll use um, and. You know, seeing that uh, you know, seeing that uh, you know, T8 is kind of that um, you know that cutoff area. I'll take into you know consideration. Um, I think the uh, you know that uh, ending on a kyphotic segment or ending just below a, a kyphotic segment is um, you know setting yourself up for um, for failure. So that's another thing that I'll you know take into account. Um, so essentially, it will be a like a, a gestalt with some um, you know patient specific characteristics mm -hmm. taken into account because. Ultimately, every deformity it has their own has its own characteristics. Everybody is you know different to some degree, um, and so alterations will be made as necessary to the uh, kind of overall um, consistency that I'll that I'll use. Great, thanks, Jared. So our next speaker is um, Fred uh, Yev Fravert. Um, Yev is one of our uh, outstanding fellows. Uh, he did his neurosurgery residency at UCLA. Um, and uh, he's heading to Texas next year. And he's done some great work this year, a couple of research projects on um, prone lateral. Uh, he's got a, a wide array, a array of um, research interests. And um, I thought that this paper uh, was a great paper for Yev to review. And it discusses using Hounsfield units and looking at um, other ways to assess bone density. Good morning. Hi, can yeah. you uh, can you hear me? Yes. How Fantastic. 
Not too bad. Sorry, I can't be there in person. I'm at uh, the Global Spine Congress here in uh, in Vegas. And yeah, this uh, this paper definitely uh, uh, you know definitely aligned with some of my research interests. So it was a, it was a good choice. So the you know the the paper in question um, is titled uh, "Association Between uh, Lower Hounsfeld Units and uh, Proximal Junctional Kyphosis and Failure uh, at the Upper Thoracic Spine." Um, sorry, give me one second here. Having a little bit of trouble with the, uh, with the slides. Okay, are you able to see my slides again? Yeah, we can see it nice. Fantastic. So the uh, um, the background, as you know, we've heard from all of the other presenters, uh, PJK and PJF are uh, pretty common postoperative complications, especially after long segment spinal fusion. Um, we've already discussed, uh, you know, many of the strategies to uh, to mitigate PJK PGF, but they, uh, you know, they include um, uh, proper uh, anatomical uh, distribution of lumbar lordosis, uh, good selection of the UIV, all these soft landing zone techniques. Um, uh, kind of newer things are age adjustment. Uh, for alignment goals, uh, and then uh, obviously bone mineral density optimization. Uh, historically, um, bone mineral density optimization um, uh, required uh, DEXA scanning uh, to be performed, but um, uh, more recently, uh, CT densitometry uh, has been used as an alternative due to uh, uh, various factors that make it uh, logistically uh, superior. Um, and the present study aims to evaluate the predictive value of specifically CT densitometry uh, for uh, bone mineral density evaluation uh, uh, with respect to PJK, PJF risk um, of the upper T-spine with, uh, with long segment fusions. Uh, so the study design, uh, you know, we're looking at a single multi-center institutional chart review, uh, looking at patients from uh, 2008 to 2019. Um, uh, all of the patients uh, that were selected had uh, pelvis to T1 through T6 fusion. Um, those were the, uh, you know, the, the UIV uh, for every one of these patients. Uh, minimum patient age was set to 50. Uh, and then uh, all patients had to have uh, preoperative CT and postoperative flame films available for evaluation. Uh, they set their minimum follow-up up to one year, uh, and uh, all of the patients had to have uh, no prior UIV or UIV plus one instrumentation just to facilitate uh, uh, measurement of uh, CT bone density. Uh, ultimately, the you know the authors found uh, 81 patients that they could include, uh, although they didn't provide any additional information uh, regarding the number of patients that they excluded uh, uh, according to their various criteria. Um, in the top right there, I have an example of their measurement technique where they uh, take three cuts, uh, three uh, axial cuts through each vertebra to, uh, to measure the bone mineral density. Uh, this technique is becoming uh, fairly standard in the literature. Uh, I think the majority of um, uh, CT um, uh, densitometry studies uh, have adopted this specific method. Um, uh, other data collected by the um, by the authors were uh, you know, included basic uh, demographics, relevant medical history, ASA classification, uh, the CCI, and uh, modified frailty index. Um, they also collected various operative details uh, and pre and post operative spinal pelvic parameters. Uh, so these are the results, and you know it's a it's a very large study. I only uh, I only selected a, a few things, and just uh, just very briefly, uh, kind of in line with um, uh, with uh, what the other presenters mentioned, um, uh, PJK for this study was defined as a greater than or equal to ten degree change between postoperative films and uh, uh, immediate postoperative films and final follow up, uh, and then PJF was defined as fracture, fixation failure, or kyphosis requiring surgical revision. Um, so in the top left there, you have the uh, the patient demographics uh, uh, spread across uh, all patients, um, uh, and then the uh, the groups that experienced uh, PJK or PJF, and uh, those without PJK and PJF. Um, not really anything remarkable there. Uh, you know, one thing to look at is the distribution of. Um, uh, UIV among all the surgical cases that were selected, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, you know, T4 is the uh, the most popular, and that that does seem to be the um, uh, 
you know, the trend in, in clinical practice that I've seen as well. So their, uh, their study mirrors that. And then in the top right, you can see the, um, uh, the spinopelvic parameters, um, uh, both pre-op and post-op, uh, as well as, uh, you know, statistical analysis demonstrating that um, there were uh, significant changes to everything that they measured post-operatively, except for uh, pelvic incidence, which is uh, what you might expect, given that that's a, uh, that's a fairly fixed uh, parameter. But everything else, uh, you know, SVA, pelvic tilt, uh, everything was uh, uh, was found to be different preoperatively versus postoperatively, and that's uh, you know that that's reassuring. That means that they were uh, achieving some element of deformity correction with all of these procedures. Um, uh, kind of the more uh, the more interesting uh, results uh, were uh, uh, that the actual analysis of um, uh, factors influencing uh, PJK PGF uh, probability. Um, uh, sorry, the the font I'm sure is a little bit uh, a little bit small, uh, but some of the salient uh, factors were uh, bisphosphonate treatment. Uh, that's that's probably not an implication of bisphosphonates themselves, but. Uh, uh, rather just kind of uh, uh, something that's correlated with pretty advanced osteoporosis. Uh, and then uh, most uh, most interestingly, um, you know, relevant to the core topic of this study is that they found the uh, mean Hansfeld units of the UIV and UIV plus one were highly uh, um, uh, predictive of risk of PJK, PJF. Uh, they also measured uh, uh, the CT densitometry of the lumbar spine. Um, and they found that that was, uh, um, uh, associated with uh, increased risk of PJK, PJF as well. And then there were some other factors that I won't dwell on. Um, uh, on the right side there, you can see the um, uh, the receiver uh, uh, operator analysis, uh, the, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, the uh, optimal cutoff that was identified was 159 uh, for the Hansfeld units. And then they split their patients into uh, uh, into uh, three uh, groups uh, with the lowest uh, bone mineral density, intermediate, and then uh, highest bone mineral density, and you can see pretty pretty definitively uh, as you uh, as you head lower in terms of uh, CT measured uh, bone mineral density, the risk of uh, PJK PJF uh, increases very substantially. Uh, so uh, to wrap things up. Um, you know, this study is pretty comprehensive. Uh, it it uh, certainly analyzes many uh, PJK, PJF predictors uh, and focuses on uh, CT, uh, BMD uh, analysis. Um, the study was purposefully limited to very long, large uh, constructs that terminate in the, uh, in the upper T-spine. Um, this was, um, you know, this was by design just to make sure that the patient population was uh, uh, homogeneous, but also uh, limits the generalizability of the study to some extent. Uh, this study demonstrates the significance of uh, CTBMD at the uh, UIV, UIV plus one as, uh, as a predictor of PJK and PJF pretty definitively, I would say, in my assessment. Um, uh, of course, it's hampered by all of the, the usual factors that are intrinsic to a retrospective chart review. Uh, and certainly a, um, a you know, prospective study would be, a, uh, would be better, but uh, obviously that would be uh, pretty difficult to execute. So yeah, that was a great, um... Uh, review in an excellent paper. Um, so you're going to go out and practice as well in the next couple months. So uh, what's your strategy on preventing PJK and ultimately having PJF in your practice? Well, I'm not. Time? I'm not entirely sure that that all PJK and PJF is preventable. I think. I think uh, the take home from many of these studies is that uh, even even with optimal patients and, and strategies, you're still going to get some. But certainly, um, uh, you know, uh, patient optimization, uh, good, uh, good preoperative patient optimization is, uh, is very critical. I think the, you know, the study I just presented showed that uh, having a CT bone mineral density of the UIV and UIV plus one uh, above 195 was highly protective for PJK, PJF. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily a, a strong believer in the, um, in the soft landing zone uh, techniques, although they, they do seem to be at least partially validated by the literature. Uh, I, think, um, I think what's most intriguing is the uh, uh, kind of the hybrid technique where you do a, a partial minimally invasive approach uh, to the UIV and UIV plus one. Um, I think uh, that's something that I'll certainly try in the future. Uh, perhaps, you know, perk screws for the upper two levels just to uh, minimize disruption of the anatomy. Um, uh, see, see how that goes. There, there seems to be some evidence in that direction. And then the other thing is just, you know, very good post-operative uh, PT. Um, j just make sure that the patients are, are getting good nutrition, just facilitate healing as best as you can. Great. Thanks so much, Yeah. So I'm going to hand it over to Jens to close us out. Um, I really appreciate all the great talks. 
um, today, and this is an important topic. I think there's, uh, as you guys pointed out, there's lots to learn, there's lots unknown, um, and uh, there's, there's definitely more to do. So, Jens. Thank you, Rod. Great job. Thank you, SSF. And uh, congratulations to our fellows. All of them did a very good job. We don't have an answer to proximal junction failure or uh, kyphosis. Uh, we clearly have to educate our patients about this possibility. This is a multifactorial process, and we will need to have a much better risk analysis as strategies. We have a risk coefficients for all of these factors. But again, right now we need to educate our patients. We need to take the time to pre-add them where possible. And we have a number of uh, options available to diminish uh, the effects. Uh, we don't have an answer. Uh, with this, I thank you and thank you, Rod, for putting this together so nicely, and all of our fellows for their great contributions, and all of our viewership for uh, being interested in participating in this well. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. Happy uh, Friday, and I hope everyone has a great weekend.